Now, taking the retreat Christ our Lord himself would certainly give, the first subject he speaks about is hypocrisy, which is, for most of us, a very, very considerable worry. We all know that we are different in public to what we are in private. I was very struck when Father Thaddeus Pelchar um, told me of his experiences in Dachau concentration camp. He was arrested as a boy of 18 in Poland and was in, I think, Dachau or Belsen for the whole war. And he told me lessons from this horrifying camp which have always remained with me. And one of them, which I thought was so very impressive, how he was asked a question in a lecture, how far hunger affects faith. And he answered that when a man is hungry, then his faith is very greatly tested. In fact, you could almost lose your faith when you haven't got enough to eat. And he went on to say that in Dachau, when people were starving, educated people, graduates of universities, um, civic worthies of previous days, when they were hungry, they behaved disgracefully. And that men, doctors of the universities, went out at night to steal other people's rations, and that when they were hungry, they stooped to the lowest. Whereas criminal men, whose record before they got into Dachau was most disgraceful, when they were all hungry, these chaps suddenly appeared, some of them, to be, a, to be noble at heart. And that's why when our Lord came on earth, he took St. Matthew and Magdalene and these people because he knew they were genuine. Whereas it's perfectly possible for men like ourselves, because we've never seriously been up against it, to appear a law-abiding, highly liturgical, top-heavy with indulgences, uh, but in fact never tested in the way that some people who fail have been tested. Sincerity, therefore, in the heart is the key thing. I find it so very important today, what our Lord tells us, that what you do in secret will one day be proclaimed. If I don't pray in my room and face God in my room, and if I can, my religion is entirely on the stage with other people, then my religion will produce in me eventually some kind of nervous breakdown. Wherever you have a conflict going on, not in public but in your heart, then you start having nervous breakdowns, you start drinking, you, you want to get away from yourself. Now it's interesting that when our Lord spoke to Satan, when he was going to throw him out of that possessed man, and Satan asked to be allowed to go to, into the pigs, and the pigs immediately, the whole lot, destroyed themselves. When our Lord spoke to Satan, and he said to Satan, what is your name? Satan answered, my name is Legion. And it's an extraordinary thing that much of evil today is this conflict. You find a person, I, sometimes in the old days, the little shopkeepers who bought a shop, they were so thrilled to make it go and to have new ideas and to have bright and be success that they could work 18 hours a day and never get ill. Indeed, it, we've all had it. If you've got something you, you really believe in, then you never have any mental ill health. But when, once you're doing one job when you know you're not suited for it, or once you're leading a Catholic life and are doubting behind the scenes, once you start this, then you get complete misery. And that's why I'm perfectly certain that it is simplicity which leads you to God. Simplicity doesn't mean that you're a goof. It means that you're not made up of parts. You're not in conflict. But the greatest happiness comes in life when you are one. That anything double brings misery. And we want to beg of our Lord that he would help me then, at whatever cost to myself, to face reality and become single. Now, how do you do it? Well, I, it took me 40 years of great distress and sometimes even thinking of leaving the church and certainly often thinking I wouldn't, want, wouldn't go on to be a priest. And I must say, thanks to the help of extraordinary writers and people, I've now found the whole thing suddenly fits again. But it is a process that is very painful, but one may have to go through it. Now, the first thing then is 
I must know what I mean by my heart. This is not, as I say, we're not talking about Valentines or Beatles songs or Sweetheart and Depart and all these other sloppy things that the crooners give us, that this is a really basic thing. It is from the overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks. Teresa said to her nuns, sisters, remember that the center of your hearts is not empty. And Augustine's famous statement, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our hearts will never rest till they rest in thee. Augustine wrote his famous prayer, Lord, make me pure, but not yet. And he's a doctor of the church. It's amazing. We, they, they chop all that out in the books. They don't tell you the truth. He said, I was afraid that God would hear me too soon. That's what makes me feel we could scrap half our spiritual reading books and get back to Thomas More and Augustine, and you get back to the real, what ev nearly everybody goes through in life. So therefore, you come back to the heart. Now, what have you got to have in your heart? And our Lord himself, I'm certain this is what he talked about at Galilee, what he'd talk about now. The first thing, as he said, is that I must face the problem that I could be double, and that he and the infinite God who made me out of nothing is going to judge me by what goes on in the center of me, not by what I, is on the surface, because you, you can, you're an actor on the, in public, whether you like it or not. But when you're in your room and there's no audience, you fight this terrible struggle of loneliness. You can make a hell of a noise, switch on the radio, talk to your budgerigar, as most of the women do, play patience, kill time, which is an awful expression, or spend a fortune on the telephone talking to your friends so that you won't be alone. Two-thirds of America are dodging being alone, and I think three-thirds of England. It's only Italians and uh, people like that who, don't, who are quite prepared to face reality. Reality is, I simply must be alone sometime to face what existence means. And then when you are alone, you come then to the center of your heart, and our Lord gives us a most extraordinary sentence. Having looked at his friends with this great crowd standing round, our blessed Lord then, looking at his friends, therefore a Jew and me, having told us not to be hypocrites, he then goes on to say, but I say to you, my friends, not sinners or enemies, my, those who are my friends, I say to you, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I will show you whom you shall be afraid of. Be afraid of him who, after he has killed, has power to cast you into hell. Yes, I say to you, be afraid of him. Isn't it funny you would think our Lord was a redemptorist or something? You're giving a sort of blood and thunder mission. This funny idea today that in the, you know, if you want to have the true faith, cut out all fear, away with hell, purgatory out, nothing but sort of harps and cigars in heaven, that our Lord started with hypocrisy and then said, now look, if you're my friends, be scared stiff of God. And you know, for years, I always used to think this isn't right, and then all of a sudden you realize, whether our Lord tells you to be or not, you are scared stiff of God. It's basic. You can't be a man and not be afraid of the next world. So Hamlet was, and so Macbeth was, and so all Shakespeare was, and St. Ignatius, and Thomas More, and Augustine, and the whole caboodle. I used to think you ought to try and stop this, but when our Lord said to me, I tell you, be scared of him, I thought, well, what a relief now to be told that what I, I already am is right. Years ago, I used to be very afraid of death, and I remember saying it to an old provincial, I, and he said to me, well, Father, you are lucky, that's the beginning of life. And since then, I, I, read to, I wrote my life of Thomas More, and reading it, and he was the most amusing man on God's earth, and Thomas More's one preoccupation from early childhood was death. And the same is true of Mr. Chesterton, who again is a most sparkling philosopher. In fact, you can't be a humorist unless you are aware that this world is going. And God himself is terrifying. I mean, if you cheat and say God is so kind and merciful, he makes buttercups, ladybirds, bluebells, you see, that's all right while you're still in the sort of nursery, but once you ever see real horror, then you sort of say, well, where's God fit into this? I mean, look at these poor little kids that are born without intelligence. Look at cancer. 
Look at old age when we all get twisted up. Is this a sort of funny thing that the devil does or is it that the f supreme being allows it? What about those of us who saw service in the war? One of the most salutary things that ever happened to anyone, I found in London during the air raids, we suddenly began to lead a real life. Because you had two tons of dynamite just over your head, you it's an extraordinary thing, you suddenly lived truly. You suddenly, for example, all class distinctions stopped. And all rows stopped, and status meant nothing. If you're going to be blown up the next night, no advantage in being a gentleman. The most extraordinary thing that in the air raids, everybody talked to each other, people no longer hoarded things, they gave away what they had, they suddenly lived reality. This life could be finished at any moment and then God. Now God in one sense is not frightening, but in another sense he is frightening. You see, the artists have so destroyed reality that today you can't take heaven seriously. When I see Botticelli's picture of heaven with a lamb standing on an altar and bishops swinging thuribles and angels playing sort of ukuleles, you know, you kind of feel, can this be the real thing? The whole thing is so odious. And when you get sort of pictures, therefore, of God himself, etc., which are all infantile, then it's better to be an agnostic than swallow this rubbish. I know any number of very sensible men who would be, who'd join the church tomorrow if they weren't asked to accept things that intellectually are contradictory. And therefore, the next world has always been fright frightening. When Moses heard the voice of God, he fell flat on his face in terror. Every time an angel's mentioned in the scriptures, there's always fear. If you met an angel, you'd be running for the train at Barrington like lightning. When Our Lady saw the angel, the angel had to say, Fear not, Mary. When the shepherds at Christmas heard the angels, the angels started off saying, Don't be afraid. St. Joseph, when he had this dream, Moses and Abel, it's most interesting, Teresa of Avila, when she had her first ecstasy, she was in absolute panic that she was going mad. Because the next world, and the spiritual world, is very frightening. Now what's interesting is that our blessed Lord tells us this. And one of the most terrific moments in your life and mine is when all alone in your room, you say to God, you are the complete boss. If God sends me to hell, I can do nothing about it. I can't say, well, that's not fair. Sister said you didn't do that. Question three, four, five in the catechism. Or I can't say, excuse me, I made the four, nine first Fridays and therefore you can't touch me. If, if Hitler could send all those chaps to Belsen, if there is a supreme being, he can do what he likes with me for all eternity. And this we must face. Even masses for my soul have nothing to do with God. God is the boss. He does just what he likes. And you know, the moment you know, realize this in the center of your heart and you, and you say it to God with words or without words, all of a sudden your religion is built on what is true. That's what I found. And it's most interesting, you see, that this is basic. And, that, and my, the center of my heart, my prayer, must be this. That I tell God he can do what he likes with me. Now, I found that most of the saints, went, all the intelligent saints, all went through something like this. They'd leave it out of the books, you see, in the Victorian age. I don't know what you call it in the States, but the last century. I don't know why, to help us and edify us, they chopped out all that made religion real. Poor Saint Ignatius himself, the most tough saint, spent his whole first retreat uh, wanting to kill, kill himself. He wrote it down in his autobiography, but nobody reads it. There was a hole in the floor of the corridor in the Dominican convent where he made the exercises. And Ignatius tells us he spent the whole time feeling, I'll jump in and finish the whole thing off. We never see the hear that now. I find that St. Thomas More, in his Dialogue of Comfort, about 18 to 20 pages on the danger of suicide, melancholy, the, how to get fears out of his head. Yet he was the most witty man. I find St. Teresa of Avila, her autobiography, full neurotic beyond all measure. And yet if you read her books, each book she gets more sane until by the last one, the interior castle, she's completely herself. You could find it with St. Paul. If you read St. Paul's life, you read the, the beginning of his life and then the last words he wrote to St. Timothy when he was an old man, and you'll see the marvelous thing that happened to him, but he was scared stiff at first. 
It really is thrilling. The most remarkable is St. Francis de Sales, because he is usually regarded as the most benign of all the saints, and so he was. When he was an undergraduate, St. Francis de Sales suddenly realized that God knew from all eternity where he would be, whether he'd be in heaven or hell. He suddenly grasped this. And it produced in him the most appalling sort of nervous melancholy distress. He couldn't get up for some days. He was sweat covered with sweat to think that his fate for eternity was already settled. And then one day he got out of bed and he stood up and he said to God, well, even if you send me to hell in the future, I love you in the present. And then he was, became the sanest man in the world. Completely at peace, but you have to face this. That God could do what he liked with me. And therefore our Lord tells me, you should fear God. And the beginning of prayer is when I say to God, I can do nothing against you. I have no power that you do things that I love, but you also make things that are a mystery to me. That there's suffering in the world, that there seems to be pain, if there's a God, then I must talk to him about that. I can't just blame that on science. After all, the atomic bomb, the scientists actually sort of put it into a sort of pod, but it was God who put the power into the atom. I don't find going to Mars, I haven't got there yet, but when I get there, I don't think this is going to solve the problems. There'll be another lot of problems until the Jesuits open a university there. <laughs> but the strange thing is, when I don't think science is making things any clearer. It's, it's not in my lifetime that each new thing they discover adds another whole lot of problems. But, and by the time they've got test tube babies and you can choose the sex of your kid before you're born yourself, and I don't believe it's going to solve the problem. Each man's going to sit, if he's a man, he's going to sit in his room and look at the stars and wonder what the heck he's doing here. And the first thing he has to do is to tell God. In the book I wrote, We Neurotics, I followed St. Ignatius <coughs> and St. Thomas More in suggesting how good it is to lie down on the floor to pray. Half the Jesuits in England thought I was cracked because they didn't know St. Ignatius had said it. But the strange thing is, if you lie down on the floor to pray, as I say, it's the most humiliating posture there is. And the Indians, the Hindus, all these people have known it, that in your heart, the basic thing, whether you lie in your bed or lie on the floor or whatever it is, the strange thing is, if you're in that position, you don't have to say any words. God only has to look down and see you lying there looking like a crusader or something, but it's the most extraordinary way of praying, and it's not by accident that the psychiatrists make this relaxation a key to sanity. The only thing is they can't give you complete sanity. They haven't got the answer themselves. They're half mad. It's only God who can... It's only this religious thing that gives you simplicity. First, then, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And if I, in my prayers, have the courage, and it takes a lot of courage, that knowing that I'll be talking to myself for all eternity to accept God's authority, then I begin to lead a most marvelous life. But to try and hide that, to postpone it, to think that calories and vitamins and proteins and gargle and all these funny pills we have give me any security and my life is one long terror. But then you see our Lord then passed in the same passage to a most extraordinary statement. Having said... Him you shall fear indeed, he then says, are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? And yet not one of these is forgotten before God. Yes, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Therefore do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Therefore our Lord, in one passage, tells us first of all you should be scared stiff of God, and secondly, that you should not be scared stiff of God. And I would say this extraordinary balance of the two fears, or one fear and the alkaline that cancels it out, that this is the whole center of my, one's heart. I have every reason to be afraid of God except for one thing. He happens to be my father. When St. Paul said that, you, any of you who are married, you've got kids, they look like you, they talk like you, they even imitate you, they sometimes swear like you. And, but they look like you, and every now and then a kid says something, and a father remembers, my Lord, I thought that very thing myself. There's some extraordinary relationship between parents and their children. St. Paul says of God, from whom all fatherhood is derived. 
The relationship between a uh, father and his child is based on the relationship of the infinite God to my soul. He didn't need to make me. He could have made Our Lady a million times if he wanted. He could have had the whole world full of immaculate conceptions. And we'd all been singing hymns all day. But funny enough, God didn't want that. He could have made St. Teresa of Lisieux, like they do in the repository shops. Millions and millions coming out on a belt. But what a dull world. The, like, artists don't produce the same face all the time. Novelists, unless they're very bad novelists, don't keep on producing the same characters all the time. Whatever else happened, I don't know why he did. All I know is I'm sitting in my room talking to myself. I'm reality. And therefore the being who made me particularly wanted me. Therefore, he, God is caught, not by that he's not powerful or that my five, nine first Fridays tie his hands, but because he happens to love me. That in a very odd way, heaven will not be complete for him if I'm not there. It's a mystery, this, but it's true. Our Lord told the parable of the prodigal son, which is entirely based on that. It isn't the story of the prodigal son at all, if you read it properly. It's the story of the father who couldn't forget. Our Lord said, first of all, the man who had the 99 sheep and he lost one, he left the 99 because he couldn't be happy while one of his sheep was missing. Nothing to do with the sheep. The sheep hadn't made the first Fridays. But the man wanted the sheep. He said, it's my sheep, and he wasn't going to let it be eaten up. Now, you see, this is an amazing thing. At Mass, we say, now in English, just before the Paternoster, we say, and formed by thy divine word, we dare to say. Terrified of God, he could send me to hell for all eternity. I can do nothing about it. I dare to say, our Father who art in heaven. And that's why St. Teresa wrote a, half a book on the words, our Father. Ignatius says, lie on the floor and think of the word Father for an hour. It's the whole of religion. Why I'm not afraid of going to hell is because, not that I've got any merits, but because God's heart is tied, and I know it. This terrific fear which I ought to express and not be surprised if it's in me, that is conquered by this much more remarkable thing, the love of God. But let us notice, we should not be preoccupied with salvation. A man in Britain, a very intelligent man, said to me, I, Father, I'd love to be a Catholic, but you'll all spend your whole life trying to get me saved. And he's thought this a contradiction of God, and it is. That this sort of trying to be safe by getting millions of indulgences, I'm all for indulgences, and I love the First Fridays, but I, if you make the f First Friday communions, you make it for the love of our Lord, not that you'll dodge hell. It's up to God to save me, and it's up to me to love God. And if I gave my mind entirely in the present moment to loving God, if every day I bowed down my head in front of him, then it's up to him to save me. That this sort of preoccupation that I'm going to somehow dodge God's wrath if I have St. Martin de Porres on my side is all Huey. I don't believe the saints are only thrilling for, for me because I see they went through the same panics as we go through and ended up completely sane. But when it comes to prayer, you leave the saints out. You leave the whole lot out. You leave Our Lady out. Even the Metatrix of all graces, they're lovely things, but they're not basic. Even our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament's only a means to an end. Mass is a means to an end. The end is God. And therefore, when I'm in my room, I'm able to tell God straight away, I, my whole eternity, the whole of talking to myself, the me that's got all these desires and things, you're, I'm absolutely in your hands. I can do nothing. That's what you mean by adoration. And then suddenly, or all of a sudden, you suddenly realize, yes, as God says, every hair of my head is numbered. I can't add an inch to my stature. I can't stay alive for a second. Nothing I can do will keep me alive. And then you suddenly realize, and yet I'm entirely safe. It's most interesting that if you feel your heart beating, it's all kept going by a piece of gristle. I think you call it muscle. There's a little piece of stuff that goes up and down in the middle of your heart, and as long as it keeps beating, you're safe. And therefore, it, as this is the truth, once you see it like this, you'll realize Thomas More, having realized this, he couldn't take life seriously. 
And when he saw Henry VIII and chaps with chains on and, and sort of presidents of huge industries, he's only got a bit of gristle in the middle. And that's why God must split with laughter at Pharisees and pompous people and people wrapped up in themselves and people dashing around confession after confession. It's only a piece of gristle in the middle. Indeed, if you take your pulse, you, that's the best way to pray. I find if you come into church, you make the sign of the cross, take your pulse. If you can find it, you find you're dead for a year. But if you, if when you find it, you hear a thing going, pom, 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 pom. Now that's reality. Whether you're an atheist or a Catholic, if your pulse sticks, you're, you've had it. And when you found your pulse, you say, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, and you're a saint. Nobody could do more than that. And you see, I haven't, I've kept to our Lord's two passages, therefore, the fear of God, and then no fear of God, for the right reasons. This is at the center of my heart. You never have another nervous breakdown. You suddenly have a purpose in life. You stop worrying, and all of a sudden, you become a Christian. And I'm quite certain that if you and I thought of our Lord's words, we'd be the people who would bring sanity to a world which is very, very troubled at the moment.